All right, so I just want to start by thanking the organizers for this opportunity. Uh, it's been a really eye-opening and great meeting. So um, I'm going to give a slightly different point of view. Sort of, we've discussed a lot of interesting statistical genetics approaches, and I think there is a lot of potential for machine learning approaches, particularly uh, deep learning for uh, leveraging these kinds of large-scale data sets for non-coding variant prioritization. Um, my talk's going to be slightly critical, but also sort of focusing on uh, the road forward and how we can improve these models. So just to put things in perspective, uh, we've managed to collect pretty large reference data sets. Uh, as you can see, our, this is sort of a cartoon of the data from uh, ENCODE and ROADMAP. Uh, you've got uh, thousands of cellular contexts, uh, whole genome assays measuring uh, hundreds of biochemical profiles, uh, functional genomics profiles, and these data sets serve as pretty nice large uh, compendia to train machine learning and deep learning models um, and sort of what we focus on primarily and where I think the, the, these, uh, these kinds of data sets are most useful with these kinds of techniques is uh, for sort of a context-specific uh, regulatory annotation of the genome uh, alongside distal interactions between these kinds of elements, uh, then leveraging these models to decipher context-specific sequence patterns, uh, and then try, trying to use these kinds of models to interpret uh, regulatory variation. Um, so uh, sort of the machine learning formulation of this problem is a little orthogonal to how it's typically done in statistical genetics, where you're typically doing association tests per variant or something of that sort. Here the key idea is that uh, a single functional genomics assay, uh, in this case I've shown like, uh, you can think of this as a chip seek or a DNA seek or whatever assay, uh, gives you a genome wide readout. And so you can think of sort of, uh, if you bin the genome into little uh, windows, uh, you get millions of these kinds of windows with different kinds of sizes. And each of these sequences map to some kind of binary label or continuous label. And so you can use classification or regression algorithms to learn these mappings and then perform in silico uh, sort of mutations and predict effects and outputs and so forth. Uh, so obviously you can use traditional machine learning methods for this problem, but uh, uh, one of the nice advantages of neural networks and deep learning is they can learn representations de novo from data, so from raw data. So an example here is if I give you, uh, you know, a 100 base pair or 1,000 base pair DNA sequence and I want to map it to some kind of binary or continuous label, how does a neural network actually achieve this? Uh, the key point is that neural networks are actually not that complicated. They're just sort of higher order versions of logistic regression or linear regression. Uh, the main idea is instead of operating on the raw input data, uh, you have layers of neurons, each of which are like pattern detectors. So if you have neurons acting on DNA sequence, they are learning motif patterns. Uh, as you'd expect, any particular motif could exist anywhere in the sequence. So you typically take these neurons and scan the sequence. So you have, let's say, in the first layer of the neural network, you have uh, several hundred neurons, each of which is trying to learn a motif detector. You scan these using a convolutional operation. And the key idea is you can stack these neurons one on top of the other. And each layer learns uh, combinatorially more complex uh, patterns. And the final layer of this model is, in fact, a logistical linear regression. So you're doing pattern discovery and then performing some kind of classification. So the key idea I want to focus here is on the ability of these models to learn powerful representations from the data without making any specific assumptions about what kind of features they might have. Uh, the other nice thing is you can combine various data sets and learn joint models. So instead of learning like one model for every TF or every accessibility data set in every cell type, you can learn one unified model across all of these cell types. So this is referred to as a multitask convolutional neural network where it's the same DNA sequence except you're predicting multiple outputs simultaneously. So is that particular sequence accessible in cell type one, cell type two, cell type three? So you jointly train it on thousands of chromatin accessibility data sets you share parameters and hence you're able to learn more effective models. Uh, so just to show you what these, how these perform, I think one important thing to realize is that uh, neural networks come in all kinds of flavors and uh, take it with a uh, large grain of salt whenever you see results presented in the literature because uh, here I give you examples of the exact same data sets. So I'm showing you models for four different transcription factors. Uh, these are uh, chromosome wide predictions. Uh, the blue bar is actually a classical position weight matrix. Uh, the, the orange, uh, the yellow bar is a 2015 nature paper called DeepBind. Um, you can see actually it does very marginally better than a position weight matrix. Uh, and then as you look at the other bars, these are the same data, also neural networks, trained differently with different model formulations. And you can go from anywhere, you know, a precision of 0.2 uh, with, uh, with sort of a suboptimally trained neural network 
to a precision of 0.6 or 0.7, which is a dramatic increase uh, simply by changing how you set up the training data set, how you train the models, and how you perform the evaluation. Uh, so these are what I refer to as first generation neural networks. Uh, these are classification tasks. You can also do this for, instead of transcription factors, you can do this for chromatin accessibility. And again, you see, if you train these models right, you can actually get really high chromosome-wide performance in the range of 0.8 average precision uh, across the whole genome. It's an incredibly hard problem, and baseline models don't come anywhere close to this. Another nice thing about these kinds of models, as I mentioned, is they can learn powerful representations. That means you can take reference models trained on, trained on large data sets, and then transfer them to a new cell type uh, of interest. So uh, on the right, I'm showing you uh, a performance uh, sort of accuracies of models, which are trained de novo on new data sets. So uh, you, let's say you have a new cell type and you have a chromatin accessibility data set and you train a model just de novo on it, you kind of get a pretty nice performance. But if you take a pre-trained model, a model that was pre-trained on thousands of previous cell types, and then you fine tune it, you can get huge jumps in, in prediction performance. Um, so these are first generation models that sort of either binarize data or predict them at sort of uh, coarse resolution, 200 base pairs or so. Um, uh, the second generation models that are starting to come out now, you'll actually see quite a few coming out in the next few months, uh, are these profile models. So here the idea is you directly go from sequence to nucleotide resolution uh, count profiles, stranded <laughs> profiles. And you, uh, these kinds of models actually don't make any assumptions about you know, uh, how you discretize the data, how you pre-process the data, you directly work on BAM files. Uh, the advantage is you, you actually lose minimal information and the, the models are able to capture much more interesting uh, information about not just like chromatin accessibility or TF binding, but also uh, chromatin architecture, nucleosome positioning, very subtle signals which are very important for uh, in, uh, predicting the impact of regulatory variants. So here I just want to show you an example of what we can do with uh, sort of chip, uh, chip exo, extremely high resolution, TF binding data. Uh, on the top you see uh, observed tracks and on the bottom you're seeing predicted tracks. And this is literally a nucleotide resolution. So uh, you can get extremely high precision uh, predictions uh, at the nucleotide resolution on completely unseen chromosomes uh, um, for various kinds of assays. Uh, so those are just some performance numbers. I'm not gonna to dwell too much on that. The key point you might wanna ask is, can these models actually generalize beyond just sort of overfitting to the data that it was trained on? So one nice proof of concept is if you're learning models for transcription factor binding, uh, can they actually predict expression effects of those enhancers? And here's a really nice example of a model that was trained on uh, ChIP-seq data, or ChIP-nexus data for OXOX, NANOG, and KLF for transcription factors. And we use the model directly to predict effects in MPRA. So if you take these, uh, these enhancers, you can create synthetic or real enhancers in mouse embryonic stem cells. And uh, we measure the expression levels through, uh, or report expression levels through MPRAs. You can see this is the observed and the predicted. And the key point is the model was actually never trained on MPRAs. So it's actually picking up functional signal, not just like uh, some kind of you know, artifacts of chip seek or transcription factor binding. And this is key, so you can really transfer these models to make functional predictions as you go forward. So a key point is how can you leverage this to actually understand variation? So, so far I've shown you they can predict uh, molecular phenotypes quite well. Uh, so one nice thing is you can take these models and actually interpret them. So here's an example of a model that was used to predict uh, GATA1 transcription factor binding. So one question you can ask is which nucleotides in the sequence are actually contributing to that prediction? Uh, so you can take the output of a neural network, you can decompose it recursively until you get sort of a decomposition of the contribution of every nucleotide in the sequence to that output. And there are many different methods to do that. We developed a method in 2017. It's one of the fastest and most accurate methods for this kind of contribution decomposition. So just to show you what it can do, it can take pretty low resolution data, like a chip seek data, uh, you know, here's a chip seek peak for a transcription factor. Similarly, attack seek peaks, usually 200 to 400 base pairs. And when you zoom in, uh, you know, the, the height of each nucleotide corresponds to the contribution of that nucleotide to that specific event. You can see they really home in on nucleotide resolution uh, events. Uh, these are in fact GATA transcription factor, chip seek, uh, sorry, GATA transcription factor binding motifs alongside other kinds of combinatorial grammars. So you can start with low resolution data and really home in on the functional nucleotides. What's more interesting is you can learn epistatic cooperativity between sequence features. 
So here I'm showing you an example of an enhancer that has, this is real data by the way, an enhancer that has uh, you know, a GATA and a TAL motif right next door uh, driving uh, binding uh, or access, chromatin accessibility. And the key question you might ask is, are these motifs acting additively or in some kind of epistatic uh, cooperative fashion? So we can do an in silico experiment where we mutate the GATA motif right here. Okay, so we delete it from the sequence or we set it to some random nucleotides and then we recompute the contribution scores of each of the nucleotides on the mutated sequence. So you can see when you delete the GATA motif, the contributions of the TAL motif also dramatically drop, which indicates that there's actually a cooperative effect between these kinds of motifs. So I, uh, since I don't have too much time, the key point I'm trying to make is we can literally take every enhancer in the genome in any cell type of interest, detect the contributing nucleotides and the effective interactions, nonlinear effects, additive or nonlinear effects between the various kinds of motifs in those sequences. Um, so how can we use this to actually make sense of uh, QTLs or variants that affect molecular phenotypes? So here's an interesting paper from Hunter Fraser's group published uh, last year. Uh, they did a pooled uh, experiment to predict, uh, sorry, to measure um, uh, QTL SNPs that affect uh, transcription factor binding. And they had an interesting uh, phrase in the paper, which is often found in many QTL papers, that only about 0.9% of all their binding QTLs were actually located inside motifs. So this is a very confusing statement. How is this actually possible? So uh, we looked into this quite a bit more. Uh, and what we found is the neural network models actually predict binding QTLs really well. So the question is, how are they able to do it if, in fact, uh, these QTLs are not acting through canonical motifs? So here I'll show you an example. Uh, this is a, a particular enhancer in the genome. The binding QTL is located right here uh, at this nucleotide, uh, uh, which is represented by a G. If you take a classical motif and you scan the sequence, you see that it, it kind of approximately matches uh, a SPI1 motif. This is a SPI1 BQTL, so that kind of makes sense. Here's the, the QTL location. What's very interesting is if you look at this particular nucleotide right here, uh, there's a T present in the sequence. The canonical motifs say that the T is basically intolerable. Similarly, if you look at this position, there's a C, and the canonical motif says the C is intolerable. So now if you compute the score of this particular motif match at this location, it actually is close to zero. So effectively, classical position weight matrices uh, will make conclusions that these binding QTLs are not acting through a canonical motif. This is in fact a low affinity binding site for SPI1. And in fact, what you see is, if you look at the neural network's predictions, it makes, the, it makes a very different conclusion. It says that all of these nucleotides are actually functional and active, except the C and the T. So it says the C and the T are, preferred, are not preferred, but all the other nucleotides are perfectly functional, and you can get act, active binding. So uh, if you do this actually genome-wide, and you look for all the BQTLs, and you compare how a position weight matrix does versus a neural network, what you realize is that high affinity binding sites, the neural network and the PWMs perform very similarly. But as you go into the low affinity regime, that's really where you see a big boost. So what the neural networks are able to do is really detect low affinity binding sites. And it appears that most of the common variants affecting molecular phenotypes and in fact also disease phenotypes are acting through largely low affinity sites for transcription factors. And that's really one of the advantages here. So uh, one thing is that there have been several publications that have also used these kinds of models to interpret uh, uh, GWAS loci. Uh, my point of view is that if you actually look at how these models work, they only very occasionally give you the correct predictions, and there's a long way to go. Uh, I can go into details on this if you, if you want to discuss this more, but uh, the main point is they're not really trained on gold standard variants. That's one of the issues. Also, there are many issues in how you design the training and test sets and how you perform the evaluation. So these are some of the issues with the first generation models. Um, now, to, in order to democratize these kinds of models and make them easy to use, one of the sort of discussions that we've had at the uh, CDC meeting is uh, a lot of data repositories. Uh, the hypothesis is gonna be that in the next you know, five years, there's gonna be large scale machine learning models also popping up, se second generation models that actually work. And to enable those kinds of models to be utilized uh, very easily, just like you have data repositories, we've actually built model zoos for genomics. This is with Oliver Stegler and Julian Gagner's lab. Uh, this allows you to take very complex neural networks and in five lines of code with minimal dependencies uh, actually make uh, high throughput predictions. So we have actually variant effect 
uh, variant effect predictors built into these APIs for these kinds of models. So feel free to take a look, and hopefully this can be the next generation of models used uh, for genomics. Uh, so I'll just uh, stop there and summarize that these kinds of neural network models can learn actually very predictive uh, models of regulated DNA with minimal assumptions. Where they really shine is on learning powerful representations and then uh, being able to explain effects of regulatory variants, especially through low affinity binding sites. Uh, large reference data sets uh, have the potential to learn powerful representations, uh, which you can then generalize to rare cell contexts. Um, not all uh, neural networks and deep learning models are equal. The first gen models are very preliminary. I would say they're not actually camera ready. Uh, if you're trying to use them for variant prediction, I'd be highly skeptical. Uh, these are some of the techniques by which I think the second gen models will dramatically improve performance. Uh, one is better model training and less biased evaluation strategies. The second is moving from these kinds of binary or coarse models to nucleotide resolution profiles. The second is all current models are trained on haploid genomes. The key point is you want to see, you want to have variant aware models, so training these models on diploid genomes. Increasing the sequence context, which will allow the models to learn more long range interactions. And finally, I think this is a very interesting concept of treating the genome locally as a sequence and globally as a graph. So training graph neural networks that actually uh, sort of uh, can generalize uh, beyond just the local cis sequence of any element is critical. And then co-training on perturbation data sets like MPRAs and CRISPR. And finally, I think the biggest potential for disease prediction is actually integrating these kinds of uh, machine learning models with statistical genetics models. So these kind of models can provide very nice priors on variant effects, but they don't go all the way. So using these priors in statistical genetics models, I think can go really far. And finally, I'll just stop and uh, thank my, my lab, uh, my founders, and uh, collaborators. Thanks.